the rumored energy crisis is now a reality. No one really knows how serious it will ultimately become, nor how long it will last. But all of the experts agree that it will extend much further than seasonal fuel shortages. We are simply using more energy than we are capable of producing, and it's finally catching up with us. Modern technology has led us to dig and drill into the very planet on which we live to find sources for the energy which our society demands. The United States uses 17 million barrels of oil every day. Now that this quantity is no longer available within our borders, we have been forced to run pipelines across the wilderness and to compromise diplomatic commitments to satisfy our needs. And there is still not enough. Before the oil shortage, there was, in theory, enough coal left to supply the demand for another 600 years. But like oil, coal is not a fuel which can be discovered on our doorstep. And when it is found, it is ruthlessly excavated, leaving the earth permanently scarred. And yet, this is not the only trail left behind, for the burning of oil and coal fills the air with such poisonous fumes that even the act of breathing has become a serious threat to our lives. One of the first alternatives to coal, oil, and gas, or fossil fuels as they are called, was nuclear energy. The success of nuclear power is as yet a controversial issue. It does alleviate some of the problems created by the use of fossil fuels, but where can we dispose of the used nuclear fuel which is not potent enough to boil water? but which will remain dangerously radioactive for thousands of years. We ask these questions only briefly, for this report will not rehash the well-known problems of our fossil fuels, nor our concerns about the safety of nuclear energy. This is a report on the newest and yet oldest source of energy known to man. It is the only source of energy that will never run out. It neither pollutes the air nor threatens our existence, for we have lived in it all our lives. Every day, the Earth receives nearly 200,000 billion kilowatts of energy from the sun. To supply the entire world's energy for one year, we would have to capture the sun's energy for only 15 minutes. Nature uses solar energy to heat the land, the air, and the oceans of the Earth, and to move the winds and tides. Sunlight is an essential ingredient for the growth of our plants and trees. Coal, oil, and gas were ultimately created by solar energy. In fact, nearly every fuel we use is just a storage of energy originally received from the sun. Since almost everything on the Earth has some of the sun's energy stored in it, we find solar energy in some of the most unlikely places, even in our garbage. Many sewage treatment plants have discovered that they can manufacture methane, from garbage using solar energy. This gas can be used in place of our dwindling supply of natural gas. In this process, shredded garbage is mixed with water and pumped into a large digester tank. If the oxygen is removed and the sludge is heated slightly by the sun, fermentation begins. The resulting gas is a combination of methane and carbon dioxide. After the methane is purified and compressed, it is pumped into regular gas supply lines. Although some of the sewage is not used in the process and must be drained from the digester, the overall bulk of garbage is greatly reduced, helping to alleviate our garbage disposal problems. 
Just as the sun can make methane from garbage, it also moves the winds. A windmill could be connected directly to a generator for producing electricity, but the output would be too sporadic for practical use. Therefore, a number of very simple yet ingenious methods have been proposed for storing wind energy. For example, the windmill could turn a pump that would force water uphill into a storage tank. The water could then be released as needed through a turbine to generate electricity. The electricity would be available day and night and could be controlled simply by adjusting the flow of water through the turbine. This concept of storing energy by moving or lifting a mass can be applied to many other forms of solar energy as well. There has been one proposal for a floating central power station that generates electricity from the heat stored in the ocean. Liquid propane will boil in warm seawater at about 75 degrees. The pressurized gas can then drive a turbine to generate electricity. The gas then passes through cold seawater and is condensed to a liquid again and pumped back into the boiler. If we use the energy stored in the ocean, the winds, or in our garbage, we are using solar energy indirectly. But scientists have also proposed a variety of techniques for using energy directly from the sun. For example, the construction of solar farms has been proposed by Dr. Aidan Meinel at the University of Arizona. A large area of the desert could be covered with solar collectors. These collectors concentrate the sun's heat to melt sodium. The liquid sodium then boils water, which in turn drives a turbine to generate electricity. The steam is then condensed and returned to the boiler to be heated again. A solar farm generates electricity only during the daytime and in reasonably good weather. To overcome the problem of generating power during hours of darkness, Dr. Peter Glazer has designed a solar satellite which would receive sunlight 24 hours a day in its synchronous orbit 22,000 miles in space. The satellite would consist of 25 square miles of solar cells, similar to those currently used by NASA on satellites and space stations. The electricity from the solar cells would be converted into microwaves and transmitted to a receiving antenna on Earth. The microwaves would be converted back into electricity and distributed as needed. One satellite could provide 10,000 megawatts of electricity, 10 times that produced by the largest nuclear power plants. Creating fuels from sewage, using the wind for electricity, or constructing large solar power stations have great potential for supplying energy in years to come. But there is one aspect of solar energy that is available to us now. You may be able to use the sunlight falling on your own roof to heat your home in hot water, to air condition your home in the summer, and even to generate your own electricity. We asked Mr. Richard Riddleman, an architect in Pennsylvania, why we should consider using solar energy in our homes. The use of solar energy for the heating of buildings seems to be particularly appropriate for a number of reasons. One is that the kinds of temperatures that are needed in a building for space heating are uh, very similar to the kinds of temperatures that can be collected with uh, typical flat plate solar collectors. So there is not a great divergence of, of collection and use temperatures. They're pretty well matched. In a gas furnace, the stack gases leaving a chimney are in the order of 700 degrees Fahrenheit. And we don't really need that grade of energy for house heating, although just by tradition it's been appropriate, it's been available, and we've learned to use it. But it's not the best use of gas because it's capable of producing much higher temperatures and doing much more work at those temperatures. The tendency has been to overcome climatic conditions by brute force rather than finesse. The University of Delaware has nearly completed a model solar home under the direction of Dr. Carl Bohr and has named it Solar One. It is the first home designed to receive 80% of its energy for heating, cooling, hot water and electricity from the sun. 
On the roof are mounted solar collectors which work like greenhouses. The glass covers let heat in, but not out. The hot air inside the collectors is then pumped into a heat storage system in the basement. When the house cools at night, air is heated by the storage material and circulated throughout the house. To air condition the house in the summer, hot air from the collectors passes through a heat exchange machine which cools the storage material. In this way, the house is cooled rather than heated by the sun. Hot air from the collectors can be sent to the water heater as well. If there is not enough sunlight for heating water, gas heat is automatically switched on. If bad weather is persistent, this hot water can also be used for heating the house. Some collectors are covered with solar cells, which generate electricity directly from sunlight. This electricity is then stored in batteries located in the shed on the right. The batteries then operate the kitchen stove, the lights throughout the house, and other appliances requiring direct current. The batteries also power an inverter, which supplies standard alternating current to all of the electrical outlets. There is also a backup electrical system for use during extended periods of bad weather. Although Solar One is designed to be 80% independent of utility companies, even higher percentages of independence may be obtained in the future. In fact, some experiments are just beginning whereby a homeowner or small community may be able to feed excess electricity back to the utility company and receive credit for that electricity. The electric company would act as a centralized energy bank that would loan electricity out to the customer when the customer could not generate enough of his own. When the customer had a surplus, it would be sent back automatically to the utility company and be credited to his account. If you were away from home on a hot afternoon, your house could be earning back part of your electric bill. You would pay only for what you borrowed and did not give back. Solar One is a significant example of the use of solar energy in our homes. But if this is to become a major trend, there are many problems to be overcome. All of our building codes, for example, will have to be rewritten to allow for the use of solar systems. A new service industry will have to be created to install and maintain solar equipment. There will be problems with labor unions as to who is going to be responsible for each part of the systems. Contractors, builders, and architects will be forced to totally redesign their standard practices. New legislation will have to be written. For what would be the good of having a solar system on your roof if there were no laws to prevent the construction of a new high-rise building between your house and the sun? Although the technology is firmly within our grasp, no one has yet begun to manufacture solar systems or even parts for solar systems for heating and cooling our homes or office buildings. In fact, Richard Riddleman has been forced to design all of the parts himself for a solar-heated private home he is designing in West Virginia. There presently seems to be somewhat a Mexican standoff in the building industry where architects and engineers tend to create some of the early markets through design. And they're not likely to design solar systems when there's no hardware available. An industry is not likely to provide hardware when they see no market. So there is a necessity to catalyze the process between research and the building industry. There have to be individuals who will attempt the catalyzation on a small scale to identify all of the applied engineering that has to be done by industry in the future. And this is precisely what we're attempting to do in the project in West Virginia. In addition to the projects of individual architects, there has been a growing interest in Congress regarding solar energy. Congressman Mike McCormick has introduced a series of bills relating to solar energy. The first bill in the series will provide for the construction of 4,000 demonstration homes using solar energy on public and federal property. Well, first of all, it's important to understand that this really is a bill that, to more or less uh, push uh, the American, American industry, American manufacturing industry, our home builders and our people sort of off the end of the diving board into using solar energy 
for heating our homes and heating our, our domestic water supplies and, and even air conditioning our homes using solar energy. You see, we, we have the technology uh, for using solar energy to heat homes and to heat water, and we're virtually on, uh, on the brink of having uh, the technology worked out for air conditioning homes using solar energy. So uh, what we need to do is get to work doing it. It isn't a matter of basic research and development. It's a matter of industrial application and public acceptance. And that's what this bill does. And we have companion legislation that we are drafting to go with it that provides tax incentives and mortgage incentives to encourage manufacturers of utilities, such as air conditioner manufacturers and home builders and home owners to get into this business of using solar energy as quickly as possible. But the public acceptance of solar energy has yet another obstacle to overcome. Solar heating and cooling may add 10 or 15 percent to the cost of a new home, perhaps three or four thousand dollars for an average house. The prospective home buyer without experience in solar homes might be reluctant to spend the extra money. In reference to this, we spoke with Mr. Milton Searle, an economist in Washington, D.C. The cost of solar energy, talking space heating and cooling now for homes, will have somewhat higher initial costs or first costs. You'll pay more for the house to begin with. You'll pay less in life cycle costs or the month by month fuel bills and the like because the, the energy from the sun is essentially free. If we compare the cost of installing a solar heating and cooling system to the cost of installing similar systems using oil, gas, or electricity in an average $30,000 home, solar is clearly the most expensive. However, when we add to this the cost of owning and operating each of these systems for 5, 10, or 20 years, the solar system becomes quite competitive. It should be noted that our fossil fuel costs were based on an annual price increase of 7.5%. But the energy crisis has caused prices to skyrocket, and it's anybody's guess how high they will be 20 years from now. Finally, we must consider the possibility that at some time in the future, oil and gas will simply not be available at any price. Although solar energy may find its first applications in private homes, the other examples of systems discussed earlier in this report demonstrate its great and varied potential. Serious consideration should be given to all of these proposals, including those which may appear to some to be only science fiction for they may, in fact, have equal or even greater potential in solving our long-range energy problems. But we have to be realistic about what we can really do with it. Uh, the impact of, uh, of an aggressive research and development and demonstration and application program for the use of solar energy would be very small, will inevitably be very small. It, could be, it cannot have a major impact for the next 15 to 20 years in this country. But we should start now and we should start exploring all avenues and, and using solar energy where we reasonably can, as early as we can, because some of its applications can be important, particularly to the individual homeowner in heating his home and heating his water and cooling his home. Um, we, we, must, we must initiate all the other programs and, and, and uh, follow out with our research and development in them because in the long run it can be important. In the latter part of this century, and in the early part of the 21st century, there is every reason to believe that solar energy can have a major impact on the energy situation for this country and for all the world. Why should we settle for 19th century fuels in a 21st century society? Why should we continue to destroy our planet in search of these fuels and then poison the air when we use them? Solar energy has been available for millions of years and will continue to be available for as long as we need it. Nobody can increase the cost and no one can choke off our imports. It neither pollutes the air nor destroys the earth. It's free and it's clean. No other source of energy can claim these advantages.